drink from only my soul let the king of my heart be the shadow where i hide the ransom for my life oh use my soul you are We're super glad you're here with us this morning. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good, good. <sighs> Let's pray over our time together today. What do you say? Lord, we love you so, so much. And we're so grateful for our family here today. We thank you, God, that you promised that where we gather, you're there in our midst. That you're going to move, that you're going to do something incredible. And we have every confidence in you this morning. What an honor it is to be in Christ today with everything that comes along with that incredible truth. Thank you, God, that you made us new creatures in him. You made us saints, that you give us a, a song to sing, that you put breath in our lungs this morning, that we might give it back as a sacrifice of praise. We trust you, God, with this time. We love you so, so much. Thank you that you enjoy spending time with your children. You 
circumstance is not the way we wish it to be. Every financial struggle we might be going through, every job loss, and whatever else this world has thrown at us this morning, we just 
just speak out the name of Jesus over them, knowing that you give rest, that there's power in your name. There's no other name by which men are saved. You are worthy of all praise today, Father. So right now, God, we're all ears to what you have for us. Bring us something special today. We want to know you more, Lord. We want to know your heart just like David did. This is your time. Jesus, we sing this morning. Amen. Amen. We'll have a seat. Our ushers will begin in the back. Join me as we pray over our offering real quick. Lord, we trust you. We thank you for your provision. God, that you blessed us with so very much. Multiply this offering today. Use it to further your kingdom here in this community. Help us to be great stewards that which you've given us dominion over for just a short time. We trust you in it. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of praise today because he's worthy, he's good of all of our affection and our love. Amen. And amen. In just a second, we'll be turning over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. So just to give you a head start there uh, in the biblical text this morning, looking forward to getting into our study today in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 17. We're continuing the series, Taking on Your Goliath. And over the last several weeks, we've identified the fact that, that all of us, at some point or time in our lives, we have had a great challenge or a great obstacle. We've had our very own Goliath. And, and perhaps over the course of time, maybe we've had many Goliaths, many giants, many big obstacles uh, in our lives. And one of the things that we we even have seen here in this study of taking on your Goliath is just as Goliath, whose name, by the way, means to unveil or to reveal the Goliath doesn't mean giant it doesn't mean great warrior it means to unveil or to reveal and so what Goliaths do is they unveil or they reveal weakness weakness in us I know even in my own life sometimes my Goliath has revealed to me an area of my life that I have yet to submit to the lordship of Christ an area that I've protected, that I've guarded, that I truly haven't surrendered over to the Lord. And because that's a weakness in my life, Goliath, or the challenge or obstacle, comes against me and, 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 and reveals and unveils that soft spot, that tender spot, that area of vulnerability in our lives. I want you to do something for me this morning. I, I want you just to, first of all, just... Close your eyes, okay? Just kind of sit there for a second. Just close your eyes. And for one, we take absolutely nothing for granted. One, we come here to this place to, to worship, to give our time to the Lord. During this time, we're asking Him through His inspired Word to speak to our lives. We take absolutely nothing for granted in this point in time, at this point in time. So, Lord, we yield ourselves to You this morning, Father. We are opening up our hearts and our minds to what you have for us uh, through the biblical text. We acknowledge to you, Father, that right now your spirit is alive, moving and working all around us and in us. And I pray, Father, that we would be aware of how your spirit is moving and working in our lives right now, Lord. So, Father, we come against all uh, distraction. Uh, we come against those things in our lives that that pull our attention and our heart and our focus away from you, God. And in this moment right now, we want to give you our full and our undivided attention. We're even asking you, Father, by the power of your Spirit, uh, to do a work here, to, to move in our midst, in our lives, and in our fellowship this morning here, God, we are asking you to do mighty and wonderful things in us. 
So, Father, we give you this time. We acknowledge that only you, through us, Lord, your power, can come against and take down obstacles and challenges to us, Father. And so, Lord, as we yield ourselves to you in this time, we're asking you to do that which only you can do. And I want you to think back to a time in your life where you were facing a mighty obstacle or a big challenge. A time in your life where you found yourself on your knees asking the Lord to deliver you. Maybe you were in a situation where someone's health was failing. Maybe it had been a terrible accident. And you found yourself saying, God, please, would you please move and work here? Maybe it was a time in a relationship that you're, you can remember a relationship really, really going through a, a difficult time or season. And you remember Praying to God, God, would you please give me strength, give me peace. Help me through this. Maybe a divorce. Can you remember a time maybe in your life when a layoff came to your company or your plant? And you found yourself without a job. A wife and small kids to take care of and and you can remember losing your job and praying and asking God, God, would you, would you please take care of my family? Can you remember trying to get through school? You were in finals week and all your hopes and dreams were dependent upon how you were going to complete this course and Every other domino that needed to fall in your career was predicated upon that last week of how you did. Can you remember the pressure? Can you remember the stress? Can you remember the anxiety? And you cried out to God and you said, God, would you please? Would you please help me? Not just to get through this, Father, but to do well, can you remember a time of season of great depression? And it seemed like everything in your life was just falling apart. You didn't even have the strength to get out of the bed. And you just wanted to close yourself off, shut yourself off to the world. You battled suicidal thoughts and ideologies. And you thought, man, my family and me and everybody around me would be so much better off if I just wasn't in the picture. I can't handle this pressure anymore. And you, and you cried out to God and you said, Lord, you're my own. I need you, Father, to do something in my life. I am at my wits end. You lost a loved one. Your spouse of many years. You felt lonely, lost, desperate. God, what am I going to do without them? How am I, God, I don't, I don't even know how to take care of this house. I don't know how to take care of these bills. I don't know how to help our ch Lord, I'm lost. Would you help me? As you open your eyes this morning, I remember a time in our lives, it was during our first pregnancy. And um, I mean, all of this was brand new to me. Emily shared with me that we were pregnant and, and, and you know, I'm just trying to take all this in. 
I'm excited. Everybody around us is excited. Looking forward to what was going to come. And oh my gosh, you know, it's just, just kind of overwhelming, to be honest with you. I was just kind of overwhelmed. And, and it's kind of one of those things as a guy, you know, when the wife says we're pregnant, you're like, okay, well, I'll take your word for it because nothing's really changed for me. And I remember going through those first few weeks and, you know, I can see that maybe her mood's changing. Uh, I can tell that, that her energy level's changing and this kind of thing. But I'm still just kind of a dumb guy, right? I'm just kind of a dumb guy, kind of, kind of okay, I, I'm taking your word for this, you know. And one afternoon I was out hunting and I was in my deer stand and I got a text message from him. I got a call. Please come home. And Emily miscarried. And I remember her grieving that loss and going through that time. And again, I'm, I'm kind of a dumb guy. I'm like, wow, I mean, I didn't even really understand what we had. And I really don't understand what we lost here. But I'm sensing this grief, but yet it's not hitting home with me. And for the next several months, I never cried. I didn't grieve. I just, I just didn't know. And then not too many months after that, not too many months after that, Emily comes back and she says, we're pregnant. And I'm like, wow, this is exciting. And we go through the pregnancy and then we had the day of delivery, and I remember being in the hospital and, and them bringing Katie out and putting Katie in my arms and looking into her eyes, and, and I was like, oh my gosh, she is so beautiful. And then, then they come back, and they took her out of my arms, and they said, we think there's some problems. Her white blood count is really, really high. It's elevated. We think there might be some uh, lung issues going on. They're not developed. We don't know for sure. That could be the issue here. They put her in a little oxygen thing. And they said, we're going to look possibly, you know, flying her to Coast Harris. And I am like, whoa, what is going on here? Emily was back in the room, and I'm taking all of this in, and, and it's, it's just, it's overwhelming to me. So I go flying down to the chapel of the hospital, and I went in there to the chapel of the hospital, and I, I fell on my knees in the chapel, and when I fell on my knees, I began to grieve, I began to weep, I began to cry, and then it was like the Spirit of God said to me, Alan, this very child, this very child that you've been holding in your arms, that you're concerned about losing now, is what you lost months ago. And I began to weep and to sob, and I, at that point in time, grieved the loss of what we lost months ago. And I asked God, I said, Lord, I don't want to go through this again. Would you deliver us? Would you help us? And she turned 18 last November. When you come to 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're at that point in the story where, to remind you, the army of Saul is on one side of the valley, and the army of the Philistines are on the other side of the valley. The Shephelah that we talked about was a series of valleys and ridges that connected the coastal plains to the mountain regions. The mountain regions is where the major cities were established. Philistines, big, big enemy of Israel, were making a move. 
if they could get to Bethlehem in the mountain area, they could literally divide the kingdom of Israel. Israel was still in its infancy. It had kind of a, a dual-natured relationship with the Philistines because the Philistines were so advanced that there were times that they would go to the Philistines to, to have their, their metal work and their, their weapons to have them sharpened. And, and the Philistines were so advanced, but other times they were like the, the big, big arch rival of the Israelites. And here you have the army of Saul and Israel moving down the mountain range to head off the Philistines. The Philistines are on the other side of the Shephelah, and what stands between them is the valley of Elah. The Philistines sent out into the valley of Elah their greatest warrior, their Goliath. And in the first part of the study, we looked at the nature of that Goliath and his sheer size and his strength and everything that he brought into the valley of Elah. And there he stood and began to taunt and to challenge the armies of Saul and of Israel. And he was challenging them to single combat. Single combat is when an army would send a representative out to fight on their behalf and another family would send their representative to fight on their behalf. And instead of having this big bloodbath war and battle, the two would fight it out. And whoever won as a representative of that army, the army would win. So Goliath comes into the valley of Elah. He challenges the Israelites. Send me your best man. Send me your best man that we can fight, that we can duel. And nobody is wanting to go. At this point of the story, all the armies of the army of Israel and Saul, they are fearful. And Goliath has brought out their fear, but they're not willing to go into the valley. No one's willing to go into the valley of Elah. No one is willing to take on Goliath. But there's a man named Jesse who has a son, David, and his older sons are on the battlefield. They're, on, they're in the battle line. He sends his son David, who was a shepherd, also a musician who had played in the courts of Saul. Previously, you find that in 1 Samuel chapter 16, he sends David out to check on his older brothers. David goes out, he takes some food, he takes encouragement. Uh, Jesse, his father, tells him, please bring back word to me as to how my sons are doing. David goes out. And there he finds the army of Israel in their battle array, lined up, thinking to themselves, is today today? Is the day the day? Is today the day? Is it today that we might have to actually go and have this fight? And nobody, no one person is being willing to go out and to fight. And David is there, and he hears, he hears the taunt of the Philistine Goliath. He begins to ask some questions of Saul's men. They tell him about what could happen and how the, how the king would honor a man who would go out and, and would take on the Goliath and would slay him. And remember the challenge was this. If Goliath wins, then the army of Saul would serve the Philistines. Israel would be defeated. If a man represented Israel would go out and he would win, then the Philistines would become the servants of Israel. And David hears the taunt, and he hears the taunt, and he hears the taunt. And last week, we realized that when it comes to facing your Goliath, when it comes to facing the obstacles and challenges of your life, one of the greatest powers that you have is the ability, through God's Spirit, to see things as they really are, to correctly see things. Israel, they see this warrior giant who intimidates them, brings out fear in them, and they're unwilling to go. But David properly saw Goliath. And if you'll remember, David says to the armies of Saul, he says, who, 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 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he taunts the armies of the living God? In other words, David's like, guys, do you really see him for what he is? He's an uncircumcised Philistine, which means he doesn't have the mark of God on his life. Later, Goliath would actually taunt David in the names of his false gods. Ashdod and Baal and other false gods. David correctly sees Goliath. This is not of the Lord. He is not of the Lord's people. He does not represent Yahweh our God. Therefore, he is inferior. He is unmarked. He is an uncircumcised Philistine. And by the way, he's not taunting the armies of Saul or just the armies of Israel, but he's taunting the armies of the living God. In other words, David sees this correctly and he, he understands that this is really God's fight to fight. And when it comes to you, and it comes to your challenge or your big obstacle as a child of God who's been anointed by God's Spirit, who has the mark of spiritual circumcision upon your heart and upon your life, you must understand that this battle, this challenge in your life is really the enemy coming against your God. And it's not your fight to fight. But it is God's Fight to fight through you. And he wants you to enter into that battle understanding the reality of your enemy. That your enemy, in proportion to God, is inferior and is no match. Here's the second part of this. Not just understanding the reality of your Goliath and how it stands in proportion to God and God's size and God's ability and God's strength. But the second part of this is what David's going to bring to the table now. And it's not just seeing your Goliath correctly. But it's also seeing yourself correctly. It's seeing you. The reality of you. The reality of who you are in Christ. The reality of who you are as a child of God. When you see yourself correctly, then you'll be able to look upon your life. You'll be able to look upon the past. You'll be able to see God's hand moving about you. And it's going to help you to give you encouragement and to give you confidence. As you prepare to take on this current Goliath in your life. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, in verse 31, when the words which David spoke, which he had shared with the Israelite army and saw, when the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him, bring, bring David to me. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him, your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So now they have their man. The man who's willing to go. And folks, a lot of people think you have David, this young shepherd boy, so disadvantaged, so young. And Saul's going to bring that out. Saul's going to bring that out. And I want you to know many times the taunts of the evil one, the taunts of your Goliath come at you. They say, you can't do this. You can't do this. You're not able. You're not capable. Who do you think you are? You can't stand. You can't win. You're nothing. And here's what David says back. After, after Saul says to David, you're not able to go. You are. Listen to what Saul's perception of David is. You are. You are not able. You're not able. You can't do this. You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but a youth. Mostly meaning more 
than the age of David, Saul thinks, you know what, you're just inexperienced. You don't have any experience. You, you, you don't know anything about fighting. You're but a youth. While he, your Goliath, has been a warrior from his youth. Not only, listen to this, so not only does David have the big Goliath in the valley of Elah, shouting and challenging, but when he goes to Saul and offers his services, Saul looks at him and says, oh, you can't do it. All the voices around him are saying, you can't do this. You can't do this. You're not able to do this. And then David replies back to Saul in verse 34. David said to Saul, your servant was. And I want you to focus for just a second on the word was. This is past tense. This is something that's already happened in David's life. This is something that has already happened in David's life. The word was. Past tense. Something that has already happened in David's life. David said to Saul, your servant was, was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. So David thinks back. There was this time, I, I, I remember it, I, I remember it well, there I am taking care of my father's sheep and and one day, this lion, this bear comes, comes into the flock of sheep and takes one of the lambs in its mouth. Some shepherds might say, well, I guess they're just go, there goes a lamb. Write it off. Lion, bear, took the lamb, took off with it. That's what happened. But notice what David says next. He says, I, and I want you to say the word I with me. I, I, I. David said, I went out after him and I did what? I attacked him. And I rescued it from his mouth. Notice these words, I went out. I attacked and I rescued all in the past tense. Something David's drawn back on. Something that had already happened in his life. I went out. I attacked and rescued it from his mouth. And guess what? It put up a fight. And it came back after me. And that's what lions and bears do, right? They come back. And when he rose up. Against me. I seized him. I mean, can you imagine David in that moment? I seized him by his beard and struck him. Struck past tense. I struck him and I killed him. Saul, do you know who you're talking to? Yeah, I look youthful. I look inexperienced. I'm not wearing a big shield of armor. I don't have a sword or a javelin that's as long as I am. But I've got some experience. I didn't sit back passively. I didn't let the lamb be taken by the bear or the lion. I didn't just chalk it up as another lamb that had been eaten. But no. In that moment, I went after, and I attacked. And when it came after me, I seized him. I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. He reminds him in verse 36. Your servant has killed, past tense, has killed, past tense. Your servant has killed. Both the lion and the bear. I have seen challenges. I have seen obstacles fall in my life. 
And now, this is where David starts looking forward. And this and this uncircumcised Philistine. He's going to be like one of them. I mean, you talk about guts. You talk about fortitude. You talk about strength. You talk about confidence. Why was David so confident? In what he says is going to happen next. That uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. What gives David confidence is the fact that when he looks back on his past, he saw other Goliaths fall, he saw other challenges. Overcome. And David realizes that all of those things that he had been through before was preparing him for what he faced today. And could it be the same with you or me? That when we look back on our past and we think about those times, And those moments in our lives, whatever came to your mind. As you look back and you saw those obstacles and you saw those challenges fall. That what God was doing in your life is He was preparing you. He was getting you ready. He was showing to you that you could have the strength. That you would have the power. That you did have the strength. That you did have the power, and he was preparing you for the Goliath that stands in front of you today. You know, journaling is a very powerful thing. I don't know if you've ever journaled. I don't know if you've ever written things down. Last Sunday afternoon, my first cousin gave to me, gave to me, gave to me one of the sweetest letters I've ever read from my great-grandmother. She wrote it to my grandfather, And my grandmother, on August the 27th, 1972, I was one year old. She talked about her life and how she had was leaving to her son and daughter-in-law, all of her worldly goods. And she said, I don't have much, but I'd give you millions if I could. And then she said this. She said, I know that my great-grandchildren, which would be me. I would, I would have turned one the very next day. She said, I know that my great-grandchildren don't know yet as to why Christ came and did what He did. But I know with parents and I know with grandparents, they will come to know. And then at the end of her letter that was written in 1972, she said, And when I get home, I'm paraphrasing, when I get home and be with the Lord, I'll be sure to tell her husband, Bernie, and all the family and the saints who have gone before us, I'll tell them that you all are on your way. And in reading that, and thinking back, To the faith, the hope, to realize that even then at that point in time, today as we read it last Sunday afternoon, that all of her great-grandchildren, including me, had come to accept Christ in our lives. That her words were prophetic, they were true, but it was written down. And there's something very powerful about remembering and writing down. Have you ever written something down? I, I can remember going through things in my life and thinking, God, I need to write this down. Why do I need to write it down? Why do I need to remember? Why do I need to look back on my life and see God's hand? 
Because so many times in looking back and seeing his God hand there, I can have the courage to keep moving forward now. He's been preparing you. He's been getting you ready. And David looked back and he found encouragement. He saw the reality of who he was in the Lord and the strength of God upon him. He identifies himself as your servant. He recognized the the enemy as he really was. David is seeing things correctly. But then, notice what happens next in verse 37. He doesn't just see his enemy correctly. He doesn't just see himself correctly, but he sees his God correctly. Do you think, do you think, do you think that the very God who did not let you fall and fail then is going to let you fall and fail now? David said, the Lord, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. He will. Y'all say that with me. He will. He will. He will. Why would David say he will? Because he had already done. And he counted it to the Lord that the Lord would be faithful to his promises to never fail him or let him down. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will, he will, he will deliver me. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He's going to do it. He's just going to do it. He's going to do it. David understood the nature of God. The nature of God, a godly heavenly father, does not let his children down. Now, there will be times or seasons that you may not see the hand of God moving and working, but it may be because there's a much bigger picture that is unfolding in your life. And there's a much bigger picture that's unfolding here with the Israelites and with the Philistine army. Much bigger picture, much bigger picture unfolding here, much bigger picture unfolding here. But David said he will. He will deliver me. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And David said, he had nothing else to say. But go, and may the Lord be with you. He saw his enemy correctly. He saw himself correctly. And now he sees his God correctly. And I want you to do something real quick, okay? okay? This is really important. Not only is God preparing you to take on this current Goliath, but if you look at David's life, David would one day become a king. This isn't the only Goliath he's going to ever face in his life. He's going to be a king over Israel. And he's going to have other great big challenges in his life. So what God was doing in his life was preparing him to take on the current Goliath to prepare him for what God had for him in his future. You might be thinking, I don't know if I can take this step. I don't know if I can take this on. I don't know if I can do this. And you're thinking it's only about what's in front of you right now. But God has even more for you. He has more for you. He has more for you in your life. And that's why you need to take on the Goliath. That's why you got to do it. Because he's got more for you. What he prepared you for today then will be one day what you face or experience that he's preparing you for today. And I want you to say this with me. Because David was leaning on the faithfulness of the Lord. He would say, The Lord will do it. He will do it again. Folks, listen. He will do it again. Y'all say that with me, please. He will do it again. 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 Watch this. 
and you be blessed because he will. He will do it again.